In this segment, we're going to talk about phrase-based machine translation. Now that we've set up our sort of primitive, or let's call it pre-processing of word alignment, we can understand how to actually take that piece and build it into a real translation system. So the first step we need to do is extract what we call a phrase table. And we're not going to go through this procedure in too much detail. Uh, what I'll say about it is that we have a set of sentences from our bytext. And we can draw a kind of grid. And what word alignment allows us to do is it allows us to draw in uh, associations between words in this grid. And so, like I said in this example, it's, it can be a little bit hard to actually uh, align some of these words. Um, so, you know, we won't get necessarily a perfect phrasal correspondence between these two, uh, between these two sentences. But what it does tell us is that, okay, um, you know, T and U are likely translations of each other. And it also tells us something more. It tells us that, okay, we have kind of two words here that align in this block. So, tu fei and you doing seem like they should be translations of each other. This is an okay assumption in this case. Uh, it's correct in this example, but in general, tu fei means you do or you are doing, um, and you doing just as a single unit doesn't necessarily work well. But regardless, what we're going to do is we're basically going to go through our data and draw these kind of boxes in our alignment grids. And this will give us a set of phrase translations which we can associate with particular scores based on how often they show up. There's a lot of heuristics involved in this procedure, and so we're not going to, again, discuss it in, in a ton of detail, but this is the basics of how we go from words to what we call a phrase table. All right. And now, the, given a phrase table, we can build our phrase-based machine translation system by combining that with a language model. This is just going to be an n-gram language model like we were seeing before. And given these two pieces, we are going to exploit an idea called the noisy channel, which is that the probability of an English sentence conditioned on a French sentence, assuming we're translating into English from French, is proportional to the probability of that English sentence times the probability of the French sentence conditioned on the English sentence. So basically it's like generate the English sentence and then translate into French as a way of, of sort of inverting the process. I mean, this is again similar to HMMs for part of speech tagging. We like generated the tags and then the words based on the tags, even though what we cared about was inferring the tags from the words. So it's the same kind of idea here. And what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to incorporate two constraints here. The first is from P of E, which is that this has to have high probability under a language model. And the second is from P of F given E, which is that these things have to basically associate with each other. We have to be able to translate, reproduce the original French sentence given the English sentence. All right. So that's the idea behind this noisy channel approach to MT. And uh, we have these two pieces called the translation model and the language model. Um, and again, if you actually write out Bayes' rule here, you have a P of F term. We're just going to ignore that because that's really what, what we condition on um, from the standpoint of this inference. All right, so we need a language model. Um, we're going to use an n-gram model for this. And we need a phrase table, which we talked about how to get. And again, we're going to get these phrase pairs and associate them with some probabilities that are based on basically counting what occurred, what, what phrases we see co-occur. And then what we want is we want to actually produce a high-scoring English translation of this French sentence that is produced by a series of phrase-by-phrase -phrase operations. So 
the space of ease is much, much larger than anything else we've dealt with so far, really, in tasks like hidden uh, HMMs for part of speech tagging. Uh, it was exponential in the length of the number of tags, but it was like 40 to that length. Um, and now we're going to have something like, let's say, 20,000 to that length if we have a pretty large vocabulary. So the way we produce these translations is we form what's called a phrase lattice. What we do is we take our input sentence here, Maria no dio una bofotada a la bruja verde, and we look at each possible phrase match with our phrase table from this sentence, which uh, is now going to be Spanish, not French. Uh, so on the Spanish side, una bofotada, for example, can translate as a slap. And so that's something that we would have in our phrase table here, and so we can produce this translation option in this lattice. So we find all these possible translations, and now the, what we're going to start with and what we'll focus most on is the problem of monotonic translation. How do we walk through paths in this lattice to translate every word from Spanish exactly once, um, not skipping any words, and stitch together a translation into English that looks good. So this doesn't look so dissimilar from the Viterbi algorithm, but there's a couple of things that make it more complicated. And so what we're going to end up doing is, is beam search here. Uh, so we have to think about what state we need to keep uh, essentially in the beam in order to score things. And so remember that in uh, part of speech tagging, the state was just what is the previous part of speech tag, because that was the only thing we needed to score the transition function. Here we need uh, the score of the uh, hypothesis so far. That was also something that we needed in, uh, in, in the HMM case, just as the key for the, uh, the, the item in the beam. And in this case, that score is a product of two things. It is the product over all the phrasal translations we've seen so far. That's the first term. And then the, the language modeling probability, the probability of each word conditioned on, in this case, the prior two English words if we're using a three-gram model. We also need to know where we are in the sentence and what words we've produced so far. So this is the kind of trickiest thing is that we need to remember the past word or two of English context in order to score, uh, in, in order to basically score n n future words that we put down using a three gram language model. All right, so for example, to start off with, what we do is we populate this beam after Maria, which only contains one possible translation, which is Mary. And so let's say the, the phrase translation probability there we're going to use log probabilities. Let's say the log probability is minus 1.1. All right, that's a, that's a valid beam state. We have the word, the word so far, where we are in the sentence, I'm just writing that as the index here, and the score. Then what we do is we say, all right, for the beam at index 2, after Maria no, how do we get there? So there's a couple of different options now for paths that we can take that end at this particular time step. Um, so we can get Mary not, we can get Mary did not, and Mary no. And so notice that in the case of Mary did not, we dropped information about Mary. We can fold that into the scoring from the language model, but we don't actually need to remember Mary because going forward, the language model only needs to look at the prior two words of context. And so now we have three hypotheses that end here um, with associated scores, and we're going to keep extending these forward in the sentence. Uh, and again, so the score here has to account for both the language model probabilities, which uh, are based on the number of English words you've generated so far, and each one has to condition on the prior couple of English words. And we also need to incorporate the translation model, which is just the score of each of these phrase translation options that we pick up, basically the score of each of these underlined segments in the lattice. So the score here is a product, or let's call it a sum of log probabilities. And the 
in, in reality, you have to weight these things differently. So there's some extra parameters here, and real translation models actually use several different features that we then have additional weights on. All right, so one kind of crucial thing is that once we go a little bit into the sentence, there's actually multiple ways of segmenting it and translating it. So in the third beam here, we're gonna have two types of hypotheses, ones that come from using three individual translations, Mary, no, or, or Maria, no, Dio, or ones that translate Maria and then, or uh, Maria and then no, Dio. Uh, so the slide is, is, is wrong here, the plus should be before uh, no. The beam in this case contains alternatives from multiple segmentations of the input. And so uh, we're thinking about multiple paths and they're all kind of competing with each other to get to this time step, but they've all translated everything up until this, this point. All right, so that's basically how monotonic translation works. You go through the uh, you go through the sentence until you get to the end, you do beam search, and then your top thing in the beam is going to be ideally the most likely translation under the model, unless you had uh, you know, an insufficiently large beam and somehow you uh, screwed up and, and only found a, a kind of approximation of the best translation. We can all, there, are, there are also models that visit words out of order. These are significantly more complicated, and so we're not going to talk about them very much. Uh, the state in this case also needs to track additional information about what words you have and haven't translated so that you can kind of go back and pick up the words that you haven't translated so far. Uh, and so the, the, you get this extra kind of bit vector thing in the state, and generally this is very involved to deal with. And in most cases, it's not actually necessary because if you have a big enough model that has seen a lot of phrases, those big phrases actually already capture big reorderings. So even though reordering might be very important to get things like La Bruja Verde translating into the green witch, in this case, we actually have a phrase, green witch, which tells us that, uh, which, which tells us that reordering. And so we can get that reordering even operating within the monotonic translation framework. All right, so the last main thing I'll say is that we talked about how the, uh, the, the language model and the translation model have these weights associated with them. Um, setting these weights is a very complicated process. Uh, there's a procedure called MERT for minimum error rate training from Franz Ock, where you basically form a small set of translation alternatives and then you're not doing anything like gradient descent. You're instead using a kind of line search on your parameters to figure out settings of the parameters which make the correct translations rank highly on in those K best lists or, or thousand best lists in this case. And so it's a very weird paradigm for training. Is again, not something that looks much like other things that we look at in this course. And so we're not gonna talk about it much more, but generally, it was very hard. We, we didn't have good gradient-based optimization techniques for how to train these models, and so there were a lot of sort of crazy procedures that looked like this. All right, so what I'll, the last thing I'll say about phrase-based translation is that there's a toolkit called Moses that rolls up all this stuff, um, including this uh, so-called phrase-based decoder called Faro that we've seen in these slides here. And it has a whole bunch of different models for doing uh, translation, including uh, this phrase-based technique, uh, syntactic models, et cetera. And for a long period of time, you could build basically things that were on par with Google Translate if you had enough data. And so this is a very nice tool if you want to explore translation systems that look like this uh, and is, I think, still maintained pretty actively. So we've seen here how to actually put these pieces together to build a phrase-based machine translation system. We'll talk now about alternatives to this, so particularly syntactic translation and then also neural machine translation. That's the end of this segment.